Welcome back, Washed Up Walk-Ons fans, to episode 123 of the podcast. <clears throat> and uh, folks, today's a big one. Uh, today is a podcast uh, pretty much unlike we've had because, well, we are looking at circumstances that we never really imagined that we were going to be looking at. So um, not exactly sure where this episode's going to go, but I'm pretty sure that you guys are going to hear some things that you certainly didn't expect to hear on this podcast. Um, you may hear us in agreement with some things, in disagreement with some things, understand that we all had our own individual experiences. We're going to do the best that we can to portray those experiences in a transparent way. We're going to actually pull the blinds back. I'm going to tell stories about, you know, experiences that may be parallel to some of the, the bullshit that other guys have gone through. And, and so you can see that it's not necessarily always black and white, uh, as the argument has been. But I, you know, like I said, <clears throat> excuse me, I don't know where this episode's going to go because none of the three of us ever expected in our wildest dreams to be sitting here recording this. So, uh, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over and, uh, you know, buckle your seatbelts. Buckle your seatbelts is right. Um, and this isn't, this isn't the fucking egg spin at this, at the circus. This is a fighter jet. Um, kind of kind of deal uh wow boys wow i mean the feeling that i have right now is um who gave us this platform why like we did we didn't earn it we didn't earn it we just set it up and people started listening uh drake had a really good intro there albeit he was just closed eyes looking at the sky maybe that's the best way you do it I was just in my head, man. I was trying to figure out where the words were going to come from. Yeah. I think um, before we go forward, I think what Drake pointed out, a big thing that Drake pointed out was that this podcast generally in, I would have to say all 122 episodes before this has been more or less a collective idea or a collective um agreement on certain situations sure there's been arguments um or or disagreements on certain minute uh completely insignificant details of games or stuff like that at this point um arguments about if i'm balding or not uh which is still up in the air um that's an argument that's up in the air i think it's still yet to be determined and the verdict is not out you know, um, Reggie Bush. See, this got is why back people can't agree on anything. Yeah, Reggie, Reggie Bush, Bush got brought back to USC, so maybe your hairline can get brought back to where it's supposed to be. Right. See, that's <laughs> the kind of comeback story I'm looking for. But but to get to the point is Drake, Kevin, and I all had, and this was evident through the last five days of conversation, six days of conversation, and we knew this. But when it comes down to brass tacks, we all had significantly in the details different stories, different experiences at the University of Iowa. So this is a this is a three three person pod where um, I've I've prepared something as a personal statement. Drake and Kevin will give their own personal statements that aren't necessarily as prepped, um, but they're our own individual thoughts. The 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 wash up walk-ons does not have a single belief in this on any of the certain matters. Um, specifically it's, it's us three individually. Uh, I, uh, and you'll, you'll hear me say it in here. I, I mean, let's talk about the last five days. First of all, we also have no idea how long this is going to go because this is a topic where who knows, um, the conversations and, seriousness of this issue and, and situation that has risen is one that you don't put a time cap on. Um, I guess I want to maybe open it up with um, when this broke, how, I mean, what were you guys doing? What were, how did you guys feel? Like, uh, um, was it Friday night or was it Saturday morning? I can't remember. 
So it started coming out on Friday night. I had not been on Twitter all Friday. So I woke up Saturday morning to a shit storm. A shit storm. Yeah. That's, yeah. Yeah. Let's put it that way. To put it lightly. Uh, the, the boys, the boys had been texting a few back and forth, like, uh Oh, is something about to break? Like what's going down? Um, the boys as in the Benton, the Benton Savages text group, um, which has been more active than ever in the last five days. Uh, we're recording this on Thursday night. So almost six days post this all happening, um, which some of you have, have questioned. Most of you have respected uh, because this is a s- extremely dynamic matter. And I was, like we said, I was shocked. I, I didn't think this would ever happen. I want to, I want to make clear that this isn't, this isn't some conspiracy under the rug kind of deal. Like the Sandusky thing was where stuff was being covered up. This is a thing that is so like clearly there was one side or the other there on the Sandusky kind of thing. Whereas like people knew something was incredibly fucked up. Everyone would agree that it was fucked up and you either on one side or the other, but it was being covered up. This isn't so much of a single event or several events that happened. This is years of micro events and just everyday life that is coming to light through many, many eyes and, and voices. And so um, it's just kind of a, a finally a, a, a spoken word of interpretation of everyone that's been involved in the situation. Um, so I, I guess, um, you know, all of you sitting there listening, you want to know, like, what was up? And I want you to respect our individual experiences and our teammates' individual experiences all equally. Equality is a big theme across this entire argument or not argument, but situation. So I guess I'll just go into my personal statement, uh, which I have prepared. If this sounds prepared and prepped, it 100% is because immediately once we started realizing that this was going to have to be the next podcast, um, you know, we had two guests lined up for Sunday, um, two great guests, like two, come on. Uh, two amazing guests that hopefully we can have down the road, but we mutually agreed with both guests that this was not the time and that the next, the next episode was going to have to be about this. And many of you are looking to us in this time as well, which is wild and maybe, uh, not what you should <laughs> they're, they're place in their faith in in the wrong people and yeah awesome. we're just some joke we're just some jokers man we're just and we're jokers. just as confused as everybody and exactly so uh, here goes nothing oh, oh before that um we we wanted to make this podcast um a conversation um with some of the teammates that that did speak out um we reached out to to multiple of them and due to just the wildness of this situation um, it's still evolving. Uh, a lot of those teammates, you know, um, doing stuff right now to try and uh, help and, and move forward and create solutions to the issues. Um, we were not able to come to an agreement to, to do a podcast yet with any of them. Um, but that is a hope of ours to, to do in the near future, because we want, we want, you know, the guys who spoke out, we want them to have a voice uh, on this on this podcast, and we we feel like we have a decent platform for that. So um, that that will come, and, and we did try to reach out and do that. Um, it just it just wasn't able to matriculate yet. So my personal statement: this is long and prepped, and uh, for those that listen to the pod, this might be the only the first time you y'all are excited about a long statement from me. But um, hopefully. Uh, Maybe there is something we can all agree on that I shouldn't talk too long, but in this specific situation, um, what, what needs to be heard and what you guys have all said is you want to hear our individual experiences. And so this is mine. 
Oh, and, and trust me when I say that this is, this is difficult and hard and, uh, and I'm, I have butterflies in my stomach as I begin. This. Yeah, bro. I just want to give you a quick GL, man. GL, GL here because this is uh, unprecedented territory to say yeah. the least. Um, go get him, buddy. Yeah. Palms are sweaty. Knees weak. Ours are heavy. He's got yeah. his mama's spaghetti. <laughs> Asshole about to explode. Um, okay. Uh, as you can imagine, the events that have transpired over the past several days regarding racial disparity inside of Iowa football have been difficult for everyone. This hits people in a variety of ways, and as a former player and teammate of many of the guys who are speaking out, it takes on an entirely new form. I lost a lot of sleep, laying in bed with a twisted, twisted stomach and mixed emotions. And that was I this is obviously the opening statement, but I wrote this like Sunday, Monday. It's been every night since then, every night. I lost, I woke up at 3.45 this morning knowing that we were recording this podcast and could not fall back asleep. Uh, mixed emotions, for sure. I have heard the use of the term tough conversations many times since the George Floyd incident sparked America into its current status. And I think that describes what this is to say the very least, tough for all parties involved. To enhance this situation even more, Drake, Kevin, and I hold a particularly unique role in the Hawkeye community as some of the few former players that create consistent content based on our experiences in the program. That content, this podcast, and social media in general have been amazingly positive and fun and lighthearted up until this point. However, with that, with what has come to light in the past few days, that same unique platform we have fostered for ourselves has shifted. We as a podcast and brand obviously can't be silent in the matter and it weighs heavy, um, at least for me personally, and I'm sure on the other two as well, as I feel we are a voice for the players, past, present, future, and I want us to get this right and be a part of the solution to issues. Trust me when I say it is not lost on me that this show we do is so enjoyed and respected that you all actually are looking to us in this situation. The response on social media to myself through tweets and direct messages expressing your concern for us during this time is amazing and appreciated. Before I get to personal experiences, I want to commend my teammates for speaking out for something they believe in. Going up against an entire organization and highly respected individuals, both parties of which have just ultimate power, is not easy in the least, but sometimes necessary. While it has been a roller coaster of emotions since the bubble popped, this situation is in no way about us three or the podcast. The flood of statements from our former teammates made it brutally clear that not everyone has the same experience with Iowa football that we do. And in fact, as I mentioned after Drake opened us up, over the course of this podcast, you'll find that even the three of us had markedly different experiences during our time. So why has it taken us six days to collect our thoughts and record an episode? Why wouldn't we just come out in clear and simple support of our affected teammates like many others have on Twitter? Those are great questions and they bring us to a very dynamic answer. The three of us wanted to avoid any knee jerk responses. We wanted to give the situation time to develop and be able to hear as many teammates as possible through social media and through personal conversation. Again, this is my personal statement and experience, and I don't speak for Kevin and Drake, but as those who have listened to this podcast for a while now can probably deduce, I had a very contradictory five years at Iowa relative to the experiences being described on Twitter. Many of you are saying right now, yeah, obviously you're white. That makes sense. Um, but it's more complicated than that. And I'll speak on that in a minute. Um, to, but to further the complication, I was also around or witnessed some of the stories being told. Um, little carrot indent uh, sidebar here. Actually, one of the one of the reporters did a little write up of the players claiming racial disparity or whatever people who had spoken out, and it just so happened that um, the three of us, our five years in the program, had the. Uh, if you were to graph it, kind of the majority of these claims. Um, so I was, I was, we were with a ton of these players when, when this stuff went down. 
Um, and so why is it complicated? If you're wondering if I'm saying what I'm, you think I'm saying, yes, some of what happened said, some of what was said happened. Some of it, um, again, personal experience, I know to be exaggerated. And some of it I know to be completely false and fabricated. And there is a lot of gray area in this situation. Um, now you can understand the delay in making this podcast because coming out and saying that kind of thing right now is almost impossible. And I don't want anyone to misconstrue my bottom line position in this situation, which is all, which is that all players, coaches, and staff should feel safe and treated fairly while being a part of the Iowa program. And it's clear that that has not been the case. Also, just because there were some misleading things posted on social media, doesn't mean the, the majority doesn't mean that the majority of those stories and anecdotes, specifically the isolated comments and incidents aren't true. And I actually do believe happened. There very well could have been. And after looking at the evidence likely were racist comments made when I was not present. And after reading some of the accounts, I believe the line was clearly crossed multiple times. The reasons these are tough conversations is because there are two sides to every story. And when the side of the bad guy gets told, Doyle in this situation, the party telling it can easily be misunderstood or looked at poorly. Because my experience with Doyle was positive, and I will detail some of that, I hope all that are listening can respect my experience, listen all the way through, and know that ultimately I am on my teammate's side in this. I want to make it crystal clear that regardless of my personal account of my time at Iowa, I agree that there is plenty to be done to make the culture at Iowa better relative to feeling accepted, equal, and having freedom of self-expression. Ooh. Chris Doyle is the major person in question here. Those who have listened to this podcast know that up until this point, as a cast, we have outwardly and repeatedly said that Doyle is the best strength coach in the country. Nobody in the world is better at creating a college football culture and that he played vital roles in our lives. The last of those three will never change for me. I attribute the large majority of who I am, my true identity today, with Iowa football, with my time at Iowa football, and specifically Kirk Ferentz and Chris Doyle. As an 18 year old kid, I came to Iowa football and had a long way to go when it came to discipline, dedication, hard work, respect, consistency, nutrition, working with others, the list goes on. All of these things over my five years at Iowa were carefully honed and crafted with the driving force being the culture that was in place, starting with Doyle at the top. Chris Doyle uses a style of coaching that accepts no bullshit. I would even say that he struggles to accept performance that is really, really good. Perfection and compliance to rules, both written and unwritten, are expected. Even when you do everything right and work hard, the praise is few and far between. The style, in my opinion, is what drives the constant competitive environment inside that program where every guy is always trying to be better, even if they are already great. That doesn't mean that that style is the only one that works or even that it's the best practice. When one did get a compliment or acknowledgement of good work from Doyle, it was something to talk about. I can specifically remember a few times I was acknowledged for good performance in a group setting and the feeling of impressing the strength coaches and staff enough for something to be said in front of my teammates was incredible. Those acknowledgements were one of the many reasons I worked so hard and gave my all to Iowa football. Of course, with the good comes the bad. And obviously a lot of the bad has been aired out on social media as the catalyst for this current state of Iowa football. The times where Chris Doyle would blow up on someone for not following rules or not doing something right were much more frequent. The, Chris Doyle most definitely was not afraid to single people out. In my experience, 
I cannot remember any times where those blowups in front of the entire lift group or team were racially biased, but I can definitely see how they would be processed by the called out individual as bullying or abusive. I am not free of those call outs, in fact. We have mentioned many times before that Doyle had ammo on everyone, and I was no different. I was a specialist, and everybody gives shit to the specialists. That's a given. But he also got after me about my conditioning level, especially early on in my career, my body composition. I, you know, I was called tubby or fatty multiple times, and some of my personal hobbies uh, as well, most specifically CrossFit. Um, he called me out a lot on CrossFit. Uh, I've told this story a couple times, but I myself was thrown out of an entire day of the summer program just for clearing some saliva from my mouth. I was in no way spitting at a coach or disrespecting anyone, but Doyle from 40 yards away, uh, saw it happen and interpreted it in a specific way. And when that happened, there was no other choice. So 30 minutes later, I was back at the crib with Kevin. <laughs> um, and he can very attest to that. Very confusing day for me. Yeah, very, conf very <laughs> like, confusing day. Very you, funny you, day for you, me, man. Because I got to see both times you got kicked out, and I got to laugh my ass off. Yeah. Um, that was just one of the numerous times that, that something happened to me or that I was called out during a workout. Aside from those interactions – and this alludes to a lot of what was brought up on Twitter as well, was this feeling of being on edge or walking on eggshells egg while at the facility. This feeling was more or less apparent in each player's specific situation, but it was obvious. There was always a chance that Coach Doyle was going to call you out on something. All of this is what I have always described to other people as extreme accountability. And I personally... Again, I repeat, I personally loved every bit of it. Even the embarrassing call-outs and unnecessary jabs, maybe something is wrong with me or I'm just different. To understand why I enjoyed that kind of environment, you have to know a little bit about how I grew up. My dad was my coach from third grade through graduating high school in multiple sports, and I was always expected to be the best. Even when I did better than other kids, which was most of the time, um, which is often the case with, you know, the division one athletes, you know, they're always the big fish in the small pond. Um, even when I did better than everyone else, the celebration was short and it was, and it was back to work. And I love my dad for that. He instilled an incredible work ethic in me and I would not have it any other way. That type of work ethic and discipline that I developed before college was what I found at Iowa times 10 on steroids. And I, from day one, took pride in being one of the guys who was going to make it through the Iowa program and make a name for myself. While I personally found that type of environment, that extreme environment, to be motivating and enjoyable, that in no way means that it was, clearly, or should be expected to be enjoyable for everyone. It was definitely environment, an environment that made it incredibly difficult to speak up about something you did not agree with, and one that clearly allowed Coach Doyle to cross the line with people, which is unacceptable. Chris Doyle has clearly displayed behavior that shows he is racially insensitive and racially ignorant. Going as far as calling him an outright racist to me is an extremely tough question that I have yet to find an answer for, because after five years of being a part of that program, I saw him celebrate with with and for every guy on that team. I saw him uplift and cheer for guys from all races. And I saw and have continued to see him promote guys from all backgrounds when they make the Hawkeye community proud, be it in the NFL or in their professional lives or in their communities. That being said, with what has transpired, what does all this mean? I've come to believe that there are very few scenarios in my eyes in the realm of possibility where Chris Doyle is still an Iowa Hawkeye anymore. He absolutely can't be if the allegations are true. And even if things turn out to be not as bad as they look, how can you look the team in the face and lead, create culture and gain trust after those allegations? 
I don't know if you can. And that's something I would have never imagined myself saying about Doyle or the Iowa program. I sincerely thank you guys on this podcast for listening and caring about my personal statement and those of our pod and those of the podcast in general. Again, the bravery and courage in the voice of our teammates is something to be proud of as a Hawkeye community. And I have faith that Iowa football will be better moving forward. And that's my statement. Thank you for that clue. Can we call it a, can we call it a podcast now? Yeah. If you don't want to, <laughs> you just want to leave it at that. I mean, you can. Um, and, and there are some things that I left out in there that are, um, that are much broader and, I, and are part of the discussion that I, I want to have potentially after we each kind of give our own thoughts. Um, there's, there's, this thing is so, so deep um, and, and wide. And, uh, and I feel like some of it is better discussed and not, um, not just, you know, like, like Kevin, you said early when we were trying to figure out what we were going to do for this podcast, it's better as a discussion and not to talk at people. And although our individual statements, um, are just that they're just talking at people. I think those are kind of fall into a different, um, a different category, but, um, I'll give the floor to you guys uh, and, and whichever one of you wants to speak up and kind of give your account. I'll let Kevin go next. Okay. He's frozen on the screen, so I don't know if uh, we might have to edit this part I, out. I also froze for a minute too. I know. I heard most of yours. Yeah, yeah. Um, let me text Kevin. We might have to cut, just cut this part out. but That's cool. I'm, I was downstairs feeding my dog. Okay. Kevin's joining back in. It's going to be a hell of an edit. Are you surprised it's going to be a crazy edit for this episode? Nope. I would expect nothing less uh, that, you know, the technical difficulties would reign supreme on this guy and just cause all the extra complications um, that we didn't need. It's all about the frequencies, man. Well, I think sometimes what happens is uh, sometimes what happens is when one person speaks for too long, the other kind of, you know, the other two ends, whoever's not talking kind of checks out um, because like it's not picking up any sound. And so then that starts to cause like the connection issues, I think. about 26 or 27 minutes in so i can remember that when i go to edit that's how far we are into this yeah that my statement ended at about 27 minutes wow kevin I heard says all of it except for the very end how much did you hear did you hear about uh racially insensitive and okay. then you went on to talk about, I heard another at least 30 seconds after racially insensitive. Okay. I, I said, uh, going as far to call him an outright racist is tough because of all the things I've seen him do. Um, celebrate. yeah, that being said with what's transpired, I don't see very, or I see very few scenarios in the realm of possibility where Chris Doyle is still an Iowa Hawkeye anymore. Yep. Uh, he absolutely can't be if the allegations are true. There's no place for that. Even if things turn out to be uh, as bad as they look, how can you look the team in the face and lead, create culture, gain trust after those allegations? I don't know if you can. And that's something I would never have imagined myself saying about Doyle or the Iowa program. 
and then I just thanked everybody for listening and respecting our shit. I like it. It was a very professional statement. I'm glad we had you go first. Kevin said Gervas Internet. Shocker. Here we go. There he is. Welcome back. He's on the phone you know, now. Yeah, we got to go on the phone. You know, talk about like the worst episode for Javas's internet to be taken a dump on. Oh, dude, I, I just said it. Um, what, what would you ever expect uh, for, <laughs> for this episode, but all of the extra complications on top of the episode being the heaviest we've ever done? Um, Kev, I think you heard most of my statement. You were there for most of it. I, I did. I did hear. Um, okay. Yeah, because then I you think, you, yeah. No, I mean, you, you spoke the way that you saw things, and uh, yeah, I mean, there's, fuck, man, I don't know. So, is it my turn to talk to Drake I, or you talk? I, I, no, I think we're going to let you go second. You're going second, okay. man. I want to hear what you have to say. Okay. Well, I did write something up. I wrote up like a four-page letter. And then I fucking deleted it because I just, you know, my thoughts on this whole situation have been, as you say, Clue, dynamic from Friday until now. Yeah. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm like you, man, I, I, I haven't been sleeping well. I haven't been able to eat that much. Uh, I, like my, my whole mental process throughout the day has com been completely fucked up. Uh, you know, like, like th 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 this is bothering me. This whole situation is bothering me a lot. And to say I'm conflicted would be an understatement. Um, you know, <laughs> when, I, when I was thinking about, you know, how, how to word things, you know, it feels like I'm a 12-year-old kid and my parents are getting divorced and I'm supposed to pick a side. Yeah. It's like, okay, who do you want to go live with? And Been through a couple divorces. They're dog shit. <laughs> can it can uh can like can you attest it? Is that what it feels like for you, Drake? Is it am I in the realm of Yeah, I mean yes and no. Yes, if your parents are assholes. Like my parents never put me in an awkward situation. They always made it like a very fluid, you know relationship. Um so in my experience, no, but for a lot of people, like, especially if your parents live across the country, like that's probably what it feels like. Hmm. So, you know, I, I, I've said so many times on this podcast, this is our 123rd episode. I must've said it a thousand times that I loved my time in the Iowa football program. I loved my time in the Iowa football program. I would go back in a heartbeat and do it all over again. That's what two I Two days, two and days and all. And it was fucking hard, okay? D1 football is not easy. But I would do it back in a heartbeat. Oh, man. And, you know, what makes it so awesome is the relationships you form. You know, that the, the relationships that you form and the memories that you make along the way. Because that's with you forever. Like you guys are going to be my boys until the day I die, which. Yeah, you're stuck with me, Kev. I'm stuck with you. Yeah, you're probably, un you know? unfortunately, in the situation of Drake, but I know that, you're, that you really appreciate that in my, in my friendship. <laughs> yeah, I do. I do. I really do. Um, but you know what? It's not just the players. not this guys you play with you form relationships with. It's the coaches, too. You spend almost as much time with the coaches during the season as you do with your with your buddies and your teammates. And you know, I formed some close relationships on that staff, and I have a tremendous amount of respect for that coaching staff and several of the coaches that have been called out on Twitter in the past week that mm -hmm. I consider them mentors and you know, guys that I can go back and talk with and say, hey, I need some help with something and they'd be more than willing to help me out. So, you know, to say that, like, conflicted, I'm, I'm in pain, I am angry, I'm upset, and I, I just, you know, 
everyone, everyone in the world has been lighting up my phone since Saturday about this whole situation. Friends from back home, family members, um, you know, guys that I, that I know that played back in the 80s, uh, you know, like everyone wants to know like, hey, what the hell is going on? And I haven't been able to give anyone a good answer because I don't know if I've even been able to put my thoughts together. You know, we, we, we were, we were going to do that episode on Sunday with a couple of the guys uh, who had called, who had, uh, had spoken out on Twitter. And I was really looking forward to that because I just wanted to sit back and listen, ask a few questions and listen, and maybe it'd give me a better perspective. Unfortunately, we, we couldn't, we couldn't get that done. So, you know, it makes it a lot harder for me to get my thoughts out on this. Um, you know, cause I was hoping we could have a dialogue. Yeah. Dialogue you know, is, I, is better than, like I said, right. Just cause talking it, it, right, right now it's just us talking at people, you know, it's yeah. not a dialogue back and forth. You're like, Hey man, like I know you see it this way. This is the way I felt though. And vice versa. Um, you know, so I'm disappointed we couldn't have that. And I feel like this episode is going to be subpar because of that. Yeah. And, and, and like, we're fully aware we're three of the whitest guys. Um, so that, I mean, we, we get it. And like, like that's a, it's a, it's sort of a tough look for us to come out and speak on this, right? Like mm -hmm. just three, three white kids who are from, you know, from, a nice neighborhood in Illinois and Iowa. Uh, yeah, like it's, it's, it's not yeah. comfortable for us. It's not. It's, it's no, it's super uncomfortable. And you know, we've been saying for the past two weeks in this country, you know, we need to have the uncomfortable conversations. Right. Well, I, I feel more uncomfortable doing it this way than I would if I had, you know, a couple of the guys that, yep. 1000%, you know, you know, like, I, you know, I, I much rather would have done it that way. Where was I going with this? Oh, yeah. So, it, see, I was really excited to have that conversation because up until that point, it had just been a whole bunch of people spewing shit out on Twitter. And that's easy to do. It's easy to type out 100 and something characters and press send. Is it very constructive? I don't think so. I think this is constructive. I think having a dialogue, talking back and forth with people is constructive. So, you know, it, I, I, I'm, I'm sorry to the fans that, you know, you're only going to get one side of it today. Um, and that's unfortunate. You know, and as the week went on, I was like, you know, do we even do this episode? Dude, I thought Does the same matter? thing. I, I thought because the same thing. We're just talking to the fans, you know. That like that that that's that we're just talking to the fans about this thing. This this doesn't solve anything in the in the facility right now. No, it doesn't solve anything with the grievances with the former players with the coaches. And you know, the more I think about it, this is a family issue. This is within the Hawkeye family. This is an issue that has to be solved within the family. You know, everyone and their brother has got an opinion out there on Twitter about this. But I only care about the people on the inside of the family former players, the coaches, the current players, probably the most important part is, you know, how do we all feel about this? How can we create a solution for this to make Iowa football the best it can be moving forward? So, you know, that, that's, that's why, I mean, I had apprehensions about even doing this um, because like, yeah, like everyone's got their opinions, like some fucking Senator from Connecticut had his thoughts and he like, fuck you, dude. You're a Senator from Connecticut. What the fuck do you know about what's going on? <laughs> Give it to him, Kev. You fucking take those Twitter thumbs, shove them up your ass, take a big old sniff and tell me your shit doesn't stink. Okay. Because it does. Okay. Your shit stinks too. Let us solve our family problems. Okay. And they're big problems. Big problems. Big problems. But we're going to solve them. The Hawkeye family is going to solve them. How are we going to do that? It's going to take a lot of talking to each other. A lot of really opening up. A lot of listening. 
but I'm confident that we'll get it done. Um, so that all being said, I will talk about my personal experience. You know, I've talked for the last five and something minutes and managed to say absolutely nothing. I'd be a great politician. Um, I agree, you would. I agree, dude. <laughs> I agree. And you should get into politics. You are the perfect man for it. Uh, no, absolutely not. Sounds like the worst job ever. Um, Iowa football, man. It, this phrase I've been saying in my head has just been been floating around in my head for the past week. Ever since like all this stuff came out, I'm like, okay, this is the way you perceived it, but but perception isn't reality. Perception isn't reality. The way you perceive something is probably different than the way the person sitting right next to you perceives something. And that goes both ways. My perception on this whole situation may be completely fucking wrong. Maybe right in some areas, maybe wrong in some other areas. Like, but perception isn't reality. What you perceive to be your worldview from wherever you get your news on Twitter probably isn't reality. What you perceive as a guy just being a tough guy might not be reality. He might be a bully. What you perceive as, you know, a guy coming down on you because you're black, maybe, maybe it isn't. Maybe, maybe he just, you know, expects better out of you. Maybe what you thought was just a funny joke crossed the line and is offensive to whoever you said it to. Perception isn't reality. And, you know, so I can only give my perception of the whole thing. My experience, and that does not qualify it to be anyone else's experience. But my perception was that everyone showed up at the University of Iowa for their first day with a blank slate. Black, white, walk-on scholarship. Blank slate. You've got five years to make your mark on the program. Let's see what you got. And you know what? Guys got on the shit list, you know? It's easier to get on the shit list with the coaches than it is to get off of it. Absolutely is. So I feel like I feel like a lot oh man. See it's, it's a week later, and I still don't really know how to put this into words. It's, it's tough. Let me say this. I mean, let me backtrack a little bit. Um, Kluver, you mentioned how some of the comments, you know, we weren't there for. We have no idea if they happened or not. If they did, cross the line, 100%. Yep. yep. No arguing it. What really started to bother me is when my teammates said the culture of the Iowa way of doing things yep. in itself was racist. This is the number one thing that I was going to bring up in the discussion, but I'd love to hear your initial thoughts. And that has been bothering me a lot. That is what I can't sleep over. You know, the, the, the comments that, you know, some of the coaches made or didn't make, you know, like, I wish I could have done something. I didn't know about them. No one ever talked to me about them. There's, you know, what could I have done? For, for my former teammates to tell me that the culture that we worked for for five years to build up of accountability and say everyone's in, all in, was a guise to 
you know, keep black players down fucking hurts. It hurts bad. So I started asking myself, what is the Iowa culture? What is the Iowa way? And to me, like, I just kept coming back to, we are a tough mentally and physically team. We play smart and we play physical, tough, smart, physical. You see it all the time and all the shit they put out in social media. You see it on the shirts that the guys wear around. We're tough, smart, physical. We're disciplined. The Iowa edge, that's, the, that's been the saying since 2015. Based off the book, The Slight Edge, daily disciplines. You do things right all the time, every day. It adds up. And accountability. You know, we expect leadership to come from the bottom up, from the players, you know, and to hold guys accountable. There's nothing in that I think is black or white. Nothing that could be seen as a way to keep players of color down, in my opinion. And for them to say so, I just feel like, you know, maybe, maybe I failed as a leader. The coaches probably failed as leaders themselves to say, hey, because make no mistake about it, we lost a lot of talents in our time at the, at the program. Yep. The numbers are bad. The, our black teammates were probably three times as likely to not finish through the program as a white guy. I, I, you know, Who knows? I would here. say at least, I would say at least two to one. There is, and, and that's here. tough too because you know you have to look at the. So yeah, here here's a, here's a stat. It's just all it's through all athletics, but male African American graduation rate was fifty four percent, or something like that. And so it wasn't good. And why was that? You know it. I believe in extreme ownership, so it's, it's got to be from leadership. We did not do a good enough job of communicating to our black teammates why what we did and how the way we did things was important. Because we believe that those things are important. We believe in showing up early. If you're on time, you're late. You're five minutes early. You're, you're good. We believe in showing up ready for work and looking like you're ready for work. You know, when Doyle walks into the, into the indoor, your shoes better be tied. You better have rolled out your feet. You better have done your calf exercises you're, and you're ready to go. We believed in addressing our day in the complex as a business day. We're here to go to work. You know, if you're on scholarship, you're getting your school paid for. You're getting fed. This is where you get, this is where you put in the work. This is the, this is, you know, it's Monday morning. It's time to go to work. Go make some money. Put some food on the table. We believed in professionalism. We believed in acting like a pro. On the road, you know, we got compliments all the time. Like, oh, you guys are so well behaved. Like, we love having the Hawkeyes here, bull trips, all that stuff. We believed in looking and acting like a professional football team. So yeah, dress code. You will wear Iowa issue gear when you're doing a workout or a practice. You will not wear a hat at dinner or during meetings. You know, you know, like basic stuff in my opinion, but you know, apparently it does, not everyone sees it that way. What about the jewelry though? You know what? That is something I have been asking myself. There is no earrings allowed when you're at meetings. And that rule has actually been disbanded. It's not a rule anymore. You can wear earrings now. But Drake's pretty boy did not get to wear his earrings either. Listen, man, I have been in the earrings before I even got out of high school. Uh -huh, it was, it uh -huh. was a significant amount of time before it might make I you look, You should reconsider. It might make you look better now. Uh, 
Yeah, I'm not. So yeah, but... that 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 is that is one like okay. Only affects the black guys. Sure. But basically, we you know we treated that we treated we treated everything in the complex like, hey man, you're here to work. Let's go to work. And you know, I, I saw you know the tweets like, hey guys, felt like they're walking around like on eggshells. Like, no, dude. Like, we just wanted you to show up like enthusiastic about going to work. Like, we we regulated your body language because your body language is just as infectious and just as contagious as your actual language. So we called out guys that you know would stump in you know looking like they just rolled out of bed fed or their head just pointed down straight at their feet looking like they didn't want to be here it's like hey come on let's go get a little kick in your step let's let's go come on we're you got a privilege of being able to play big 10 football let's get let's let's go you know and i got called on it sometimes you know like during the dog days of camp you'd be walking down the hallway like you got a couple ice bags around your shoulders and like feeling sorry for yourself and you know Walsh would turn around the corner. He's like, "God damn it, Ward! We got another two weeks of this. You better be ready to go." Like, everyone got it, you know. Everyone got called out. Everyone got called out for everything, and I thought that was a healthy culture. I thought that was, you know, good to keep people accountable. And I. Again, like I, it, it hurts me to 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 know that my teammates didn't feel the same way. I get it, man. People don't like being called on their shit. I was a shithead, as like going through my uh, my my puberty stage, like seventh through freshman year of high school. I was a piece of shit, okay. And my dad fucking was having none of it, and I didn't like my dad because of it. My dad called me out on my shit. It's like, hey. I know you're not a dumbass. Why are you getting a C in algebra? Because you're being fucking lazy. Go fucking study. Take care of your shit. I'm like, no one likes to hear that. No one likes being called lazy, but he was fucking right. And we applied basically the same ideas to Iowa football. And, you know, going back to the, going back to the part that our, our, our black teammates, you know, they washed out at a higher rate than, than the white guys did. So in my opinion, is, is that their fault? Or is it, is it the leader's fault that we couldn't get them to buy in and see, Hey, this is why we think things are important. And I don't know. And this, this was the part where I really wanted someone else's perspective. Cause I'm just rambling right now. I'm not making a whole lot of sense. I'm talking at, not talking with, not listening to. Like, this is, this is the part where I wanted genuine feedback. Because the way I saw things is people got treated according to how they acted. And if, so, if, like, if, if, go ahead. If you're stuck, Kev, I'm more than happy to add a little different perspective. Um, because my time at Iowa wasn't necessarily as smooth as, uh, you and Kluver's obviously, um, a couple of coaches that I certainly didn't get along with very well, uh, didn't have, you know, I, I just didn't have that close relationship with a coach until Brian came in for a position coach. So for one year, I felt like I actually had a coach that had my back. So like, you know, I spent a little time or my time a little differently than you guys did. And, um, you know, Doyle was, I feel like Doyle was exceptionally hard on me as well, but I needed it. And I came in the shithead like Kevin was just explaining. And like, that was me and his way of um, tough love is one way to put it. His way of tough, of showing me tough love and like, he wanted me to succeed, but he was never, never going to let you slack. Kind of like Kevin said, um, definitely you felt that. And I don't know, man, it, the, the thing that resonated with me was the doghouse and how everyone was absolutely terrified of Doyle's doghouse, 
because you know that once you get in it, you can't get out. And I think that that's- You, you can. People have gotten out. Cooper was in his dog. I, I was, and, and actually, you're, so this is incredible because I can actually speak on this. Um, Go ahead. And again, I'm white. So, you know, if I was black, would it have been different? I don't know. Oh, I can tell you, I can give you an example right off the top of my head of who else got out of the doghouse. Who? Josh Jackson. Josh His Jackson. first year in the program, like, you know, missing body weight, being late to stuff, missing tutors. Like, yeah. he's on the, he was on Doyle's shit list. He was on KF shit list. He was on Phil Parker's shit list. He Josh Jackson, his, his junior season, was an exemplary teammate. Exemplary. Turned his shit around. So you can get out. And, and it is absolutely easier to get in the doghouse with the coaches than it is to get out. Yeah. And, and is that I was, right? I don't know. Like, that is right. And I think that Doyle's doghouse was exceptionally hard to get out of because I do believe that as a coach, he had a tendency to hold grudges, which I don't believe is a, te- is a quality that you can have as like, you know, a leader, in my opinion, because, you know, I heard j- – I don't have examples. I'm not going to give examples because I don't want to misquote anybody. This is not my battle. You know, I'm not, I'm not a snitch, nothing like that. Never have been, but I've heard things said in that complex that even me, I was like, man, you know, that shouldn't have been said. Like there was times where th- where he was going off where things got said that absolutely shouldn't have, because I know that there was times where it was directed at me where it, it took everything in my power to not to not lose it all and throw down and i know that i have more of a tendency than you guys do to to have that like explosive reaction and in in that way i am more similar to the black culture you know and that that's the truth the black culture fights more than the white culture does and i have that tendency to like have that reaction and you know that just in similar ways so i can kind of understand the mindset where if you feel as if you're being picked on kevin said it very very well perception and reality aren't always the same if you feel like you're being picked on unfairly and it starts to get a snowball you're really in your head about it you're emotional about it anything can really set you off and i'm not downplaying what everybody is claiming i'm just saying that you know as Kevin said, in their perception, it may not have been as harsh as they believed it was, but it was continuous. And finally, they just had enough. And I, you know, I, again, I'm rambling kind of like Kevin is, but I'm just trying to explain it from my point of view. Like there was times where I felt late in the program that I had certainly earned my respect. And there was times where I flat out didn't get it. And I got embarrassed and berated just like everybody else in in right out in front of everybody and it was it was those situations where like you know i didn't feel as if i was being treated fairly and getting the respect that i deserve so like i understand in a way where they're coming from just not from the racial side because obviously i can't feel racial bias and so coach doyle is a very polarizing figure among the locker room and the alumni. There are guys who love Coach Doyle. There are guys who hate Coach Doyle. Both races. Oh yeah, you know? I think that should yeah, be like, said too. Like here. he he is a he can be a real dick to people. That's you know. Yeah, he He's, can be a dick to people. Hundred percent. Let's put let's just put it out there. Do I mean, I, can... I got I got I got called out multiple times. Yeah. Uh, did I deserve it? Yeah, yeah, pretty much I did. Yeah, whenever I got called out, Same like for me. you know, no one was immune to getting the fucking getting the smoke. The smoke, the smoke, <laughs> dude. And it was no, no, but that's the thing. It was really the smoke. Like when Doyle brought it, he freaking brought it, man. Like he, he, no one. Like I said in my in my statement, he had not only did he just bring it. But he had ammo on everybody. It was always something. Even if it was Drake, I heard it with you and me all the time. Even if if it was something as as simple as, man, I don't, 
I don't know about those muscatine kids, you know, like some, something like that. Now for me or you, probably even me, you more than me, like if he said something about Marshalltown, I don't give a shit, dude. Like I, me and Marshalltown aren't like, you know, we're not, right, I, mean, no. <laughs> like, yeah, that's, I mean, this is, this is go to, to go to your hometown. It's like, right. I, I grew up oh, there. You think you're cool. Cause you went to the Providence Catholic Celtics. Or- right. Uh, and, and this, that's a mild version of him kind of putting a jab on you he'd always say something about your hometown, but I could definitely see, um, so, you know, s- some other guys who had it, who were really, they, you know, they, they connect with their hometown. Their hometown is their identity. And something as simple as that could be seen as, could be seen as racist or something. I, I don't know. Again, this is where that dialogue comes in, but what is, you know, the perception spectrum is so wide. And, but, but when he brought it, he, he brought it. He had anything from your hometown to all of the things that you had done wrong. I talk about in, in, in the statement, I mentioned the written rules and the unwritten rules. And Kevin talked about the Iowa way and that and, and everything Kevin said about the Iowa way and our culture that we built as a team, that hurt me and confused the shit out of me really bad. Um because, because yes, Doyle kind of guided that culture, but a culture similar to this situation is dynamic, right? And it is created by every individual on that team. We've, we've talked about how some cultures were better than other cultures year to year. And that's a collective from each individual guy. And what hurt me bad, this is a tangent kind of off topic. I don't know how I got here, but what hurt me bad, same, to, same as Kevin, was when our Iowa way, when the Iowa culture, the Iowa way, was called an oppressive white culture. I didn't understand that. Okay. And I, and that's, that's one of the things that I had to kind of listen over a couple days and kind of reread tweets. And then Kevin kind of hit it on the head again, back to this whole perception is reality thing. And I do believe here's a little sidebar that be, that if there was confusion during our time about that Iowa way and the details of that, the discipline, the accountability, the individual characteristics, the, the, the unwritten rules, the rules that were on paper. If there was confusion about that and they didn't feel those who speak out white or black did not feel comfortable um, with one of those unwritten rules or with one of the written rules because it felt like they were being oppressed. You know, their, their identity or their culture was being oppressed by that rule. I, you know, it it wasn't necessarily the kind of building where you speak up and you say something like that and it gets accepted and and something happens. And that is a problem. That a hundred percent is a problem because you should be able to speak up and say something and, and not be judged um about that but then that's what that's what spirals is now you don't speak up uh again i'm 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 clearly not black but in my situation if i thought that doyle coming after crossfit was oppressing my white culture i should be able to speak up and say something about that without getting you know it, with at least getting to a point where we can have a conversation about it and we can figure that out because when then, then when those feelings fester, um, you start to view other situations differently. There are other times when you're, um, disciplined because you didn't do X, whatever, right. Um, you start to view that in a different way and you start to build this, this perception. And again, the perception isn't reality and it goes both ways. I, I feel like maybe I was, I, you know, I questioned myself. I feel like everybody questioned themselves. I sat there and I truly thought, and you two would, you two would agree with me and, and tell people this. 
Tyler Kluver is at the beginning of this, before this, was the number one Doyle fan on earth. If there was a club of Doyle fans, I was in it. As you heard yeah. from my statement. And it was hard for me to question. It was hard for me to say some of those things about Doyle because after questioning myself, I do admit that there were times where he probably crossed the line in specific incidents, jabs that he just did not need to make. But I questioned myself, does – what was our, was our culture oppressing black culture? Was – what, what was the things being asked, asked of um, the rest of the team as we sat down and made rules? Were they white and not black? Were they – it was very hard for me to ask those questions, and I, and I came back to the same thing is I, I just didn't see it that way. But I was able to come to a spot where – and empathy is hard for me just in general – as you two have called me a sociopath plenty of times, um, I, I can see how other people would perceive certain situations and certain things that way. And uh, it's, it's been a process. It's, it's been a process is, yeah, hard. Because, you know, I'll say it again. Like, I have some very strong relationships with that coaching staff coach Doyle was I consider a mentor of mine you know all the way from being a player through my uh through my internship with him like he was always someone I felt like I could you know ask questions about the profession with you know because I had interest in going into strength and conditioning um you know after my uh you know during my internship he's you know kind of you know helping me feel out, you know, what, what would the path be from there to, you know, become a successful strength and conditioning coach. Um, and, you know, like Kluber said in your statement, it was, you know, it was a no bullshit culture. Like, Hey boys, we're here to go to work. It, we are going to be mentally and physically tough football players and we are going to do it better than anyone else in the big 10. And, you know, that's the type of an environment I thrive in. That's the type of environment that my parents raised me in. Like, you know, you can go do whatever you want, Kevin, but you're going to do your best at it. And, you know, he expected the best out of you. He expected your best every day. So, yeah, it's a – to have a bunch of your former teammates who, you know, you consider friends and, you know, brothers and, and guys that you, you went through a lot of shit with come out and call out one of your people that you consider a mentor is hard. <laughs> I mean, I don't know what, how, how else to say it. It's, it's hard to, you know, listen and just, hear about i mean like like i said earlier i know that he was a poor i know a bunch of people don't like doyle but was, it, you know let, let's put that out there during our time that was evident it wasn't like everyone walked around and and everyone thought that everybody else liked doyle there was yeah, it's not like you saw doyle running walking down the halls and you went to go give him a big old hug no I mean, I mean, I enjoyed my time on the outside of the workouts too. Like sometimes when you'd eat dinner with them, like I, I enjoyed shooting the shit with them sometimes, but you know, it, it's, it, it's hard to, it's hard to hear people tell you that, you know, the, the program that you loved so much was not the experience that they had. It's hard, you know, I, <laughs> I think I said it in our last episode. It might have been the episode before it when we were talking about, uh, you know, uh, you know, race relations in America, and, you know, when everyone was riot and stuff. I said, you know, I want everyone to grow up in the America that I grew up in. I want, I, I, I wish all my former teammates had the experience that I did at Iowa football. 
And the fact that they did it, it hurts, you know, it, because <laughs> it was, that was the best years of my life. Yeah, because that sucks. It, it seems unfair that you got to do it and, and they didn't. Right. And I don't know. I, it, like I said in, in my kind of spiel, like, you know, who's, is, that, is, that on, is that on the coaches for crossing the line in their comments? Is that on, you know, the coaches and the leadership of the team being the seniors and the upper level guys, you know, setting an impressive culture? Is, is that on us for not getting the guys to buy in and get excited about what we're trying to do here? Get excited about trying to win a Big Ten championship and how we're going to do it? You know, I don't know, man. I don't know. There, in, you know, there's a lot of shit out there that, you know, exaggerated. Yeah. Bullshit. Yeah. There's, there's one of our former teammates on some high level bullshit. Yeah, I, I wanted to come back to that too. I, I kind of snuck it in there in my statement. I, yes, I, I did say that there was some exaggerated stories and I said that, um, and this is me personally, because I, I don't, Drake said for sure that he wasn't there in the specific one. I'm not going to call it out because I'm not here to call out specific teammates, but I know for a fact that two of the tweets I saw, I was in the situation and the, the story that was told on Twitter was a completely different way that it went down. I saw probably five more, you know, there's probably 40 or 50 tweets. I probably saw four or five more where the tweet alluded to, and it was probably more than this. Cause I was, dude, it was hitting hard and I did not want to read all that. It's like, imagine that it's like, Oh, let's go read everything that's tearing down what I love right now. So I wasn't mm -hmm. out there searching. I was just seeing retweets. I saw probably five more that alluded to that Iowa way, that Iowa culture or someone getting kicked out of a workout because of one of those rules that we had that I know, at least I thought I knew, not to be racial at all. It was just a rule for the team. You know, maybe it was a dress code issue or a being late or being on time issue. And it was, it was, um, it was told in a way that um, alluded to the racial issues. And I, I didn't know if it was. Here's a question I have for y'all that I just kind of thought of. Do you think that in part because we've described the Iowa way as uh, similar, like military-esque? It's very military. Sure. Do, do sure. you believe nope. that, that there are some guys who, uh, who just had no idea what they were actually signing up for? Like some of us, like I don't think I knew what I was signing up for, right? But there are some guys who come from completely different cultures who certainly didn't know that they were signing up for a military style, you know, life where people are, you know, very, very, uh, you know, captain like, I don't know. I, I, so I, yes, I think everyone to some extent has no idea what you're signing up for until you're in it. There's no way mm -hmm. you can know, but obviously that's going to extend farther for some guys. And I yeah. think, and I don't even think this is a black or white thing as, as much as it is if your family, black, white, Mexican, Samoan, whatever you are, was not a disciplined family. You know, when you guys, when you grew up and you guys went places, you showed up to, you showed up to church two minutes late. You showed up to uh, your events five minutes later, right on time. You never really had a, or or followed a dress code in your life you never no matter what race you are and that's that is who you are that is now your culture if you're 18 years of culture that's that's become a part of your identity um and then you come to iowa and that military style or kind of military-esque culture is in place hell yeah it's going to feel oppressive to what you know so now that you bring that point up, Drake, is like, you know what? Yeah, it can be a shock to the system. Especially if you get put in Doyle's doghouse. Like, think this right. is where and my mind you know, is. Now that, I'm, now that I'm thinking back, I'm, I think I'm with you on your train of thought. It's like, should we have given guys a little more leniency, benefit of the doubt, 
Bro, yeah, college for a year is fucking hard, man. Hard. And a lot of yeah. these guys don't have everything in their background that we have in our background, man. And like, we're blessed. And so like some of these guys who come in and just maybe aren't so fit, aren't so mature, man, they're a young 18, not an old 18. And they get mm-hmm. in that dog house and they don't know how to dig themselves out. And it is a snowball effect from hell. Yeah. And you're right. Because you know, Once you're in there, it's hard to get out hard. The only reason, not the only reason, but one of the only reasons I was able to get out was because I was given a starting spot. When Casey Kreider left the program, I was the only snapper on the team. There was not another player on the team that had LS behind his name. And I, I guarantee to this day, you ask Doyle if he wanted Tyler Kluver to be the long snapper for the Iowa Hawkeyes in 2014, my second year in the program, not a fucking chance. Did I deserve no respect, bro? Did I deserve to be the long snapper in 2014 based on my actions inside the program? Maybe hardly if yes. Leniency in that first year is something that is something because you can't, you can't be lenient forever. At some point you do have to grow up. Right. Right. But with, with Kevin, how you kind of jumped on that train, I think I'm on that one as well. I think the sensitivity to a guy's personal identity for that first six months to a year when he walks in the doors, I'll sit here and admit it needs to be better. It probably needs to be better in the Iowa program. I'm glad I asked that question because I think that was a pretty good one. Uh, Yeah. I mean, looking back on it. Yeah. You know, it's a shock. It like, I came from a very disciplined family and still shocked to my system. Yeah. It's like, it was that, that freshman year. Like, you know, I still fucked up every now and then I still got called out. My shit didn't like it, but it's like, Oh, fuck. Better not do that again. Yeah, dude, after I got so, thrown out of the lift for spitting, I don't think I've spit since. Yeah. <laughs> That's not true. There was, there was a long time. There was a long period of time where if I had it, – it, dude, it gets hot in that, in that freaking indoor, and sometimes you either breathe or you swallow it, and there was a long time where I turned and made sure no one saw me because I did not want to get <laughs> thrown out again. But, but you're right. So, yeah. so back, back to the point, man. There were some legitimate concerns that have been raised on Twitter, and they're being addressed. Um, there's some significant bullshit out there on Twitter too. Saw one tweet that said, "The walk-on to scholarship r- <laughs> uh, rate was ridiculous, and that coaches conspired with the walk-ons to get rid of players that are or- that are still on the roster." I'm like. That one was wild. That was that, one don't make a that lot is of, such that one, a wild claim. <laughs> that one doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Let's get rid of this talented guy and give it to the unathletic white and, dude. And also, the, like the, I think the tweet insinuated that they brought the walk-ons in and were like, "Hey, we're gonna get this guy out of the program so you can have the scholarship." <laughs> that I was like, yeah. "Well, I, I actually, d- I actually DM'd that teammate of ours, and he took the he took the tweet down." I, I, I was, you know, I was heated on that Saturday. I was like do I just like end this guy's life publicly on Twitter right now? Or do I do the nice approach and just DM? I was like, dude, take this down. You know what I mean? Right. So, you know, take some of the stuff out there with a grain of salt. Um, but you know, if, if that many people feel that strongly about, you know, this situation, then yes, obviously we do need to address things. And I'll go back to my tweet and that we tried to address it, you know, camp 2017, we have a team meeting and KF very bluntly says, I, I think you guys would probably remember this. Like, you know, we've been noticing a very disturbing trend in that if you look around the room, especially at our older classes, our, we do not have a whole lot of diversity in those classes. And he, he went on to say, you know, the attrition rate with our, with our black players and teammates has been very concerning. And so, you know, I started thinking to myself, this is chaos words, you know, why, why attrition? And so 
uh, you know, I, I started talking to some of the players. Um, uh, and this is when he brought back Jordan Lomax to talk to, to the black players privately and right after that team meeting. And, yep. You know, I wanted to have Lomax on this podcast because I'm dying to know what he told our teammates that day. And, you know, they, they formed a, you know, a kind of a, I don't know how many guys were in it, but like a kind of a little group, uh, you know. Diversity committee. Yeah, yeah, diversity committee to, you know, that KF would, you know, meet and talk with guys like, hey, how can we do better? Because we're losing a lot of talented players that we believe can be successful here, but for some reason we're not getting through to them. And, you know, that, that brings me back to Jordan's tweet said the coaching staff was unav- unable to relate to our culture. So was, does that mean that we weren't able to get through to the, to the black players? Does that mean that, you know, just not being able to relate to them? Like, uh, like, I don't know. I think what they're, I think because I, I, cause I that, said it, I said it before and I'll say it again. Like I, looking back at the rules we had in place, were they oppressive? Strict? Yes. Very disciplined? Yes. Oppressive? Hard, I, hard I, to go I, that I, far. I, 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 I could not swear in court to say that we had an oppressive culture. I, I, I would, I would, I would let them put me up on the guillotine and pull the, pull the cord and say, no, we did not have an oppressive culture. Um, but you know, that's my perception. Perception isn't reality. I don't know. Yep. I don't know. So, you know, and people have talked about the, the Twitter things. Like, is it wrong to not give the players Twitter? I don't know, given some of Keith Duncan's tweets, I'd say that yes. We got to at least take it away from Keith. We got to take it away from Keith. Um, But no, no, KF brought that up in in our senior meeting. January 2017, he meets with all the seniors together. We talk about some stuff and some issues and some rules that, you know, he's like, you know, I've been going back and forth on this. And, you know, am am I just out of the generation loop? Am I just not be able to, you know, am I wrong on this? And I will say that I was the first one to raise my hand and say, no, coach, we – we don't need to be tweeting. Like, in my opinion, there's there's nothing good that could come from it. And and I remember that. And, and you know, guys have Instagram where they got thousands of followers. Guys got Facebook. Guys got Snapchat. You know, if you want to get your message out there, you can get it out there. But I just feel like, especially now, Twitter is the place for knee-jerk reactions. And you're going to say something that you're probably, you can easily regret. Somebody screenshots it and then boom, like you said, something pretty, pretty damning. Uh, especially, I couldn't imagine being a player having Twitter during the season either. That would, oof, oof. that would have Twitter gone started. really poorly for me. And yeah, games. I mean, if you want, if you want to see why I don't think I didn't think at the time that the players should have Twitter, go look at Drake's Twitter feed. Okay, like what did <laughs> go I look do? at any of our Twitter feeds. What did I do wrong? <laughs> I haven't told anybody now, to eat dicks in a long time. <laughs> now here's now here's the other side. Here's the other side of this. Because again, like I said in my statement, two sides to every story. With the current social climate, George Floyd, how do you how do you how do you how do you stand up there and now now that rule is directly oppressive. You are you are you are suppressing of uh, a form of one's voice. Now, granted, again, you can argue the whole, well, if you want to put stuff on social media, you got Facebook, you got Instagram, like we're not suppressing you completely, but it is in some way suppression. And sure. in the current social climate, sure. I mean, uh, yeah. How, oh, how, and, how, you know how, what? Yeah. And you know, even before all this shit came up with, uh, you know, the Iowa guys that, you know, KF was, was talking about letting guys tweet. Yeah. And I, and I think it, this is what I told somebody else about the Twitter thing that they asked me. And, and I said, I said two things. One, as the years go on, Twitter and all of social media is much more second nature and more well-known and um, easier navigated. Now that doesn't mean that there's, everyone on there is 
you know, going to put, it's, it's not like 2020. Now everyone's putting smart stuff on Twitter. That's pretty clear. Not the situation. <laughs> it's actually 2020 and my tweets have gotten significantly stupider. Right. <laughs> but the classes that now come in. To, like they grew up with that shit. They grew up with social media. They know how to use it. They know when, when we, dude, you go back, you go back before I deleted them. I mean, none of it was bad, but you go back to like some of my 2009. You go, you go back to like statuses. 2011. You go back to like 2011 Twitter for Kevin. There was, was some. Oh, there was 75% some, of my Facebook statuses were like about what cereal I was eating at 1130 at night. And like <laughs> just stuff that like we didn't know that it was out there for everybody. We did, but we didn't get it. These, these kids get it. And, and then the other thing I told the person is like, um, Nick DeMarco, one of our former strength coaches, he, he made a tweet in regards to the coronavirus and um, strength coaches and their athletes that I thought was, was really good. Uh, Nick is a highly respected kind of colleague, friend, mentor of all of ours on this podcast. One of the greatest human beings there is. Yeah, probably going to be one of the one of the best strength coaches out there in short time. He put a tweet out that said, "If if you as a strength coach are worried about your players being at home during this coronavirus and not doing the workouts you provided them and not doing what you as a coach are asking them to do, you failed as a coach because your job is not only." to coach them when they're in the building on just strength and conditioning stuff. Your job is to make them better men and coach them to be better people and be more disciplined and follow rules and, and, and just become more productive people in society. And so if, if they go away from the, from the, uh, from the campus and coronavirus is keeping everybody away and they don't follow what you ask them to do, then you failed as a coach. Similarly on Twitter, I think it's probably time that, these kids know what Twitter is. You can clearly mandate it. Ma- tell them, hey, if you tweet something stupid, this is the repercussion. But you have to you have to give it to them and trust that you, as a coach, have have gotten it through to them that this is the kind you know th- this is the kind of and you're molding them to be the kind of good people and good uh, positive impact on society that if you do it right, most of the time, hopefully all of the time, you know, they take that Twitter uh, weapon and they use it for good and they, and they don't put stuff out there that would be detrimental to the program of themselves. You have to just trust them, you know? So there's another side to it as well. Drake, we kind of cut you off on your personal uh, experience. I don't know if there's any else thing else you wanted to share I mean, you, you, do you have some questions? You said you have some questions that you were going to ask me. I don't know, man. I feel like I can, I can talk when, uh, yeah. when, when talking points. Um, I mean, we've, we've kind of hit, we've kind of hit on them. Um, they've kind of come up through this 90 minute conversation a little less because Kevin took a quick break there with the Gervas internet. Gervas internet was always going to make an appearance in this episode. Um, <laughs> I have, a, I have a couple things that, that, that people are going to want to want to gonna that are wanting to probably hear our thoughts on uh, because we truly, we don't want to do another full podcast on this. Like this is tough as it is. So, you know, KF came out and made statements, right. And then Doyle came out and made a statement, which was Uh, misguided. I'm I'm curious your thoughts on those statements, open and honest. Uh, I, Doyle made a statement. Yeah, I mean, the Doyle statement was very misguided. Said he was told to keep quiet and that he couldn't. And, and, and so, like, here's, I, mean, I here's, get it. And, and made him. You know? Yeah, let me, let me finish. He was told, told to keep quiet and he couldn't. I understand that urge. Um, obviously, you're, you're being defaced, defamed and, and people are just straight on, on onslaught assault attacking you. Um, the part that that was bad was he made it an absolute. He said, I have never, I have never um, 
you know, you could bring it up, but I have never made any decisions based on racial bias or something along those lines. Um, and I don't know if that's a statement that anyone should make, even if this wasn't like, you know, like no one's perfect. Right. right. And it, and, and, and the natural instinct of a human is to judge and make assumptions and maybe act on those assumptions and judgments with decisions. Now it could be as, um, simple as you know, something super insignificant or something crazy like uh, some of the statements that were made by our t- former teammates and former Hawkeye football players of him just straight up being racist to them on a comment. Um, but, but to say never is I, – I don't think any of us three could sit here and say that, even if it was just a thought. Like no one, no race – no one's perfect. And so don't, that was bad. That was bad. I, I didn't like that. Um, and it was at a time where you can't be bad that you already, he, he already had the entire world against him. He can't do anything other than be perfect. And he just dropped the ball on that. One. Right. Um, because this was going around, I wanted to just throw this out there. This isn't even a question. Um, it's just a statement I wanted to make. There was, uh, ladies football academy obviously you know the the complex isn't closed doors right a lot of people get to visit tour it the ladies football academy gets to go through the whole thing every year um there's a sign up in the weight room that said ndh uh and 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 i saw several people on there claiming that they thought they knew what it meant and that they were claiming it meant no damn homos and that's completely false. Um, no dickheads. It dickheads. means, it, it, and it wasn't something we ever wanted to really release just because it's kind of, you know, it's kind of edgy. That's why we didn't spell it out on the sign. It just no says No dickheads. NDH. Go read the legacy book by, about the All Blacks. And, and, and I want about it in there. And I want to. Dickhead and I wanna, equals asshole. Right. And Don't I want to read, I want to read that quick too, because it applies to this whole thing. It's, it's the, it's the shot of the literally, it, the paragraph is titled No Dickheads. Wa now is your family, your mates, your team, your organization. For the Wa now to move forward, everyone within it must move in the same direction. This is the essence of team, working hard for each other, in harmony, without dissent, submerging individual ego for the greater cause. This extends to selection, no dickheads, and the fostering of connections, trust, and collaboration between all levels of the organization. In this way, people work for each other rather than for the individual glory. In the All Blacks, high standards are fundamental and are enforced by the players themselves who are trusted to do the task. Success can be traced. It cuts off there, but yeah. So that, that it means no dickheads. It's not, it wasn't homophobic I mean, or anything. And that, that, that paragraph right there speaks to the culture that we wanted for ourselves. Right. I, I, the, the, the sentence specifically this is the essence of the team working hard for each other in harmony without dissent, submerging individual ego for a greater cause. To some extent, yes, you did had, you did have to submerge individual ego. In fact, we read a book called ego is the enemy submerge individual ego. And maybe a little bit of that individual identity that was an energy leak to the program for the, for the program's greater good. And I, and, Boom. and that's that. Um, that. There was one more thing. There, well, there's a couple more things. I don't know if they're really relevant. Um, uh, the, the, the Kinnick statue got just beat up. Uh, that was hard to see. You know, there's so many sides to all this. You, you know, you've got the people who or like, well, if the Kinnick, if the Kinnick statue is like, clearly the Kinnick statue is not important in people's lives, right? That that's, that's evident. But what, what sucks is the people who, who deface it and you know, put graffiti on Kinnick and, and the statue and say that, um, it ain't right. Yeah, I, 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 I don't know how to say it. Uh, it's, I, I understand that it, you're making a point and that the statue can be repaired and the, and the lives can't be repaired, right? Like George, we can't bring George Floyd back. And so that's the point. And if that's, and you're claiming if that's 
how far we have to go with it to, to make the point. Yeah, you've got some, you've got some, something there, but I don't know if, if you're just totally in the right either. Um, and that, that was hard to see. Kevin, I know you went and helped clean up that morning. Um, I, you can speak on that if you want, but I, I just wanted to bring that up. And then no, um, and we, we went and returned Kinnick to her natural beauty. That's all, um, that's all we did. That was really good. Didn't have anything so, else. Uh, I, I guess the question I wanna, is: I want I, I want to ask you guys a question. Yeah. How do you guys? Because this is probably you know outside of coming at our culture. The next thing that bothers me the most is the way our teammates decided to go about this. How do you guys feel about going out on Twitter before, you know, going to KF? Because it fucking pisses me off. You know, um, I can't say it. I can't say it nicely. It fucking pisses me off. Because in every one of their fucking tweets, you know, and I hear them. They're hurt. They don't. Feel, they felt disrespected. They didn't like the way they were treated. But in every one of their tweets, well, most of their tweets, they said KF isn't the problem. KF gets. We love the program. We want to make the program better. If that's true, why could you and why could you not take you and your friends who felt mistreated and go to KF? It's like, hey, coach, we have a problem. We know you have a problem. You know you have a problem. You have a bunch of African American players leaving early. Here's why because we felt this. We felt this about your head strength coach. We did not like the way we were treated. Do you think that he wouldn't have listened to you? Do you think that he would have taken some of the, some of the players that were really well respected in the program and just dismissed their words like that? Send him a letter and sign, have like all 50 of you sign it. Like he, that would have gotten his attention. Okay, KF is an honorable man, and I'll go to my grave saying that. Okay? KF would have listened. Okay, you didn't need the public pressure from the entire sporting world to say, oh, I, I, I'm sorry, like, we, that, that's not right. We have to do something about that. And if he didn't listen, then you could go, go to Twitter, okay? I, I did not like that. Because um, yeah, it aired it aired our the dirtiest of our laundry to the entire country, and you know, I didn't like it. How do you guys feel about it? So, I just don't like that there were some liars, man. Like yeah, so there are some people who I have I very guess, so so wait, let me let me because that gives like I was talking about this with one of our teammates earlier. Everyone else who now has a beef with Iowa football at all, one way, shape, or form, or ever, just piles in now. And it could be complete bullshit. Like, fucking DJK. You really think KF called the cops on you? That was my you dumb motherfucker. That was you my dumb last motherfucker. Point. You gave DJK a voice? Fuck off. And then, so to, to that point, to that point, it's like when a guy like James Daniels, or a guy like Jaleel Johnson speaks out, it's something that you have to listen to, right? Because those are guys that even if they didn't feel respected, I'm sure from a coach's perspective, they will say, these were guys that we respected in our program, right? Jaleel had to overcome a lot of things in the program. He had a, he had a really rough beginning. He was one of them doghouse guys yep. that was able to get himself out, that had a super productive career, who had a ton of friends in the locker room. JD, super successful for his whole time there. Like these are guys you have to listen to, right? But then there's guys that come out who were washouts in the program for completely opposite reasons. Like if these guys are gonna try and air people out, I'm gonna air you out. You got guys like Terrence Harris coming in and we've told the story about how he came back from a, a week break, 15 pounds overweight and got made fun of for being pregnant. Like 
that doesn't have anything to do with race. You're not being oppressed there. You're getting made fun of because you deserve to get made fun of. And he yeah, then you want to come and call Iowa football a plantation. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And he, he and then he also wanted to come out and say that he was like a hardworking dude, and anybody who'll back that up. No, he was yeah. a yeah, oh for three on this podcast. He was a total scrub, right? And he had no business being on that field. They would have put Drake Kulik in to rush the passer before they would have put in the fucking cozy tank, right? So don't come at the program if you don't have your laundry in order. You know what I'm saying? If your room ain't clean, which your room ain't clean, cozy. Don't come at the program, right? Your voice is actually taking away from people who actually may have had something. Like happen. a real, yeah, a real like, grievance. Like a real right. Um, so you hit on, yeah. So Kevin, you hit on it. That hurts. That hurts the way they came at it. And I see it both ways. Uh, again, come back to the perception is not reality. They may perceive that if they did take the entire squad of all 50 um, – black players who, who had something to say they could have because they could have gathered that right behind the scenes and they could have gone to kf and they been like gone to barda they could have gone to know. anyone and said hey this is the grievance we have not only w- would that have looked more professional but they could have gathered their thoughts better than 140 sporadic tweets kind of pieced together and made an argument to, to KF, like, hey, we don't like Doyle. Get him out of the program. We want change. And told him, if you don't listen to us or you don't do something about this, we will take it to social media and use that, that public mob. So, yeah, it, it, it does. But, th- but maybe they perceived that there, was, that, you know, there was no way to do it and they wouldn't have been listened to unless they you – know, unless they – did it this way and and drake um that one that one maybe hurts me the most is is the one where where guys clearly have come out and made up stories there was one and it might have come from Karis as well who who said that when they showed up to the to the facility one day kf was walking in and they drove by and they were playing music and the, and the windows were down. And he said something like, clear, like that he didn't like their music and that there was no fucking way they were going to make it through the program. And then he spit at them. First of all, KF parks in the back of the building every single day and walks 10 feet to the door. He never yeah, – KF is never walking by your car. He never walks music. by your car that you're pocket parking on the front of the building. And two, yeah, I wasn't there. But I'll go to my damn grave forever saying that KF would not – I mean, are you serious? It's just spitting at your car as, as you guys are about to go into the facility together? Not a chance in hell. And that, and that does piss me off for James and for Jaleel because they got buddies who are coming out and, and making their voice – Less, it's not helping their cause. No, it's not helping their cause. Because some of the other guys I do Because believe, I, I believe there are genuine concerns from very genuine people about Iowa football. I said it in my tweet. I respect Jordan Lomax more than almost any other Hawkeye that I played with. And for him to raise concerns, I'm like, okay, we got a problem. Yep. James Daniels is a very, very respected Hawkeye. He's coming out. We got a problem. Some of their buddies, not so much, but yeah, I mean, I'm sorry. I just interrupted you, but no, I was done. I mean, um, you're right. There's, so there's a wide spectrum on both sides where um, there's a wide spectrum on both sides where not everything you see on Twitter is true, but some of it is true. Take acknowledge that there's a problem. And take what you see on Twitter with a grain of salt is probably be my best advice. Yeah. Um, the the um, DJK stuff was my last point that I wasn't even going to bring up because it doesn't deserve. Can uh, you tell him to eat dicks, Kevin? <laughs> DJK can eat dicks. <laughs> I mean, it's just like so many guys on Twitter too. Like I literally have seen like guys who like were in college at the same time as him, like come out and say that. Like, hey, dude, I was at your house and I saw this stuff happen. Like, how are you denying it on Twitter? Like, um, and then his story changes. 
you can find a bunch of his tweets that are like, you know, KF and I like through these last oh, few years. I got another question. How do you feel about the guys who some of whom who have like called out the coaching staff have some tweets praising the coaching staff not three months ago? And they weren't, and they weren't I, like, I, I don't know. I don't know how to feel about that. No one forced you to tweet those things. No one's telling you you have to suck off Doyle anymore. Yeah. Yeah. They're out of the I program. I, I just, that just genuinely confuses me. Yeah. Like I, that's a great question. And that is one of the reasons why I had to, I wanted to have our, 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 our buddies, our black teammates on is because, you know, Mike, Mike Daniels, Mike Daniels was one of who said, Hey, there's a problem and said and there's no one more respected than Mike Daniels in the Iowa program. Mike or, Daniels is like one of coach Dola's favorite players of all time, all time talked about all the time. But then when James came out, he, he was, he was a part of that. He, he said that there was issues that need to be resolved, but then you go back, uh, you know, to just this past season and, and Mike has a tweet that says, ain't no one does it better than Chris Doyle. He's the goat. It was March. It was three months ago, March. And then, and then, you know, like guys like Jaleel jumped on, they're, they're done with the program. They're out of there. J- Jaleel quote tweeted that and said, got that right. Nobody does it better. So it's like, you know, that, some of that stuff is confusing. And I, I, I that's, you know, it, you know what, you know, is he good at his job undeniable? I mean, if, could he still be a dick? Yeah. But I mean, if you felt that badly about him, like, dude, I don't know. Like, uh, like they don't gain anything. You, from you know? Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, I just I just thought that was weird. I don't think it's really a, a condemnation of their whole argument, but I just thought it was weird. I wonder what you guys thought about it. I thought it was also pretty contradictory of themselves. Um, Certainly a question I would have liked to have asked. So here's, so here's where we end this. We're coming up on two hours. Coach Doyle is on administrative leave. And we didn't even talk about allegations against Brian Ferentz or or really hit a subject like did coach Ferentz know about all this man I'm with Kevin here like coach Ferentz I can tell you from this perspective that Brian Ferentz is the only and I repeat the only reason that I made it through five years so I mean I have I have him and only him. If there's only one person I could thank in the entire program, there's only it, it would be Brian Ferentz. So yeah. that's one where um, you're probably going to see Drake go to war for Brian Ferentz. You there's no probably you will see me go to war for Brian Ferentz if push comes to shove. There's nobody else probably that I will lay it down for. Maybe. Can but I ask Brian, you uh, an uncomfortable question, Drake? What up? So Akram Wadley's mom put a, a video on Facebook mm-hmm. and at the end of it, uh, and this is a perspective that I, I definitely don't have. Kevin, you got to sit in meetings with the DBs every day. Um, very diverse group, mostly black. I was the minority. Drake, you sat in the running back room, um, majority black. Yep. At the end of Akram Wadley's mother's Facebook page or video, um, she she uh, played a, a, a voice memo of Akram kind of describing a, a short, uh, maybe three or four minutes of his experience at the University of Iowa. And a lot of that, a lot of that was coming after Brian. Um, and, and, and he made one specific claim uh, about Brandon Simon, who we all know, who was a defensive player, played uh, some scout team for the, for the starting offense, um, where he said that, uh, he, he literally said that Brian's words were, and I don't remember this at all. I do remember him blowing up on Brandon Simon, but he said that on the field, he was saying stuff like, I fucking hate you. I hope like, I, I, we don't want you in this program and then brought it to the meetings and continued to say that he was, he was, uh, he hopes that Brandon Simon got hurt and that somebody would hurt him. Um, do you remember that at all? The blow up happened. I mean, yeah. if we're, if we're, just I remember something. I remember something about the blow up. I was on the other side of the field. Right. I do remember the blow up happened. Because those are some pretty strong words. Like, I hate you. I wish you weren't a part of our program. I hope you. Get I don't. Hurt. I have no idea what he said. I just remember he was saying a lot of shit. And, uh, the the I hope you get hurt part. I don't. I don't remember being said. The uh, the leave. We don't want you here. What are you still doing here? 
just get the fuck out. It happened. Like if we're calling a spade a spade, it happened. And the, I don't know about the meetings, um, but I mean on the field, it happened. Yeah, and and, and that kind of verbiage, um, that he wasn't the only person that was said to, white or black. There was plenty of people over our five years where during conditioning in the summer or during um during workouts in the weight room or during practice if you weren't given 100 percent, you were sloping or sloping slouching moping around um people would you know coaches would call you out that that's a motivator i don't think it's racial hey leave we don't want you here if you if, if you're not going to give it all for your teammates and your coaches we don't want you here i heard that in high school um but there was a pretty strong stuff against Brian Ferentz and, and a few other people jumped on, on Brian Ferentz as well. Where I was taking this is um, coach Doyle, obviously the biggest question of the program. I finished my personal statement with, I don't, I don't really think um, that I see him being the head strength coach at Iowa anymore. And, and I'd like to, you know, and I have mixed feelings about that. Um, but, but what, what do you guys think? Is there, you're right. Yeah. There, there's no way. I do this. Um, that bridge is burned. Uh, it's just that yeah. from a recruit, I think, go ahead. You can't, you can't get any recruits. If you still have somebody who's got such terrible allegations and you bring them back and say, we're going to ignore this, then I mean, how, how are the recruits families going to allow them right. to come and play for this program? And I mean, there's been too many ugly stories. I think you said it really well in your statement is that even if they do bring him back, how can he perform his role mm -hmm. with the things that have been said? Yep. Like how can you take command of a lift group and demand excellence when, you know, we said it all the time. It's like, you know, it's it's hard to call out your teammates, especially when your lawn looks like shit. Yeah, yeah, you, yeah. His you, lawn looks like shit right now. You got to lead from the front, and yeah. His, so his lawn I, like shit I you know, it doesn't. It, you know, we're not making the decision. And no, and and the I investigation. The investigation will make its course, and you know, the, the players who have filed their grievances will be heard. And I I find it hard to believe that Chris Doyle will be the head strength coach at the University of Iowa going forward. Yeah. So are, are we wrapping this up now? Is that what we're doing? I think so. Unless there's anything else you guys want to bring up. I think we talked about, a, about all the subjects that have come up. Um, it's going to be a fun edit. So, I know that two hours. <laughs> Yeah. So closing thoughts. This is, you know, the ugliest chapter of Iowa football history, probably. Yeah, hundred percent. And you know what? It we said in the beginning it, it hurts because we loved our time in the program. And you know, we, we talked about it after that uh we talked about it during our, our episode on mental health. Like we almost identified as part of the program. Like we, that is what who we are. We are Iowa football players and to see Iowa football in such a ugly state hurts, you know, three years removed two two and a half years removed from the program. It hurts. Uh, you know, I will say to the fans that, uh, there is work being done behind the scenes with those who have filed grievances. Um, KF is listening. Uh, there's, you know, there's a lot of stuff going on. Um, you know, but, you know, they, they'll be heard and they'll have their wishes made known. But I, I think the most important thing right now is how that locker room that's in there now feels about each other and, and about the coaches, because you know what, we, we had our time. We're not on the inside anymore. We're, we're still part of the family, but we're the crazy distant second cousins. You know, we're not the brothers and sisters and mom and dad anymore. We're, we're on the outside looking at now, but you know, once a Hawk, always a Hawk, but 
the Hawks that matter are on the inside of that program right now. So I heard, you know, we can maybe touch on this, that there was a very emotional meeting on Monday. Very. That, you know, it all got, it all got out, out, opened up. In the Everything air. we just talked about was, was essentially laid out in a, I think it was somewhere between two and three hour meeting. Um, players crying, coaches crying, everything we just talked about. Um, open mic is what I was told. Multiple, pe- multiple people said it was life-changing and by far just the most – what will be the most infamous team meeting ever on the inside. Um, I have to think that that's a good spot to start for the, for the so, positive changes that need to be made. So, yeah, I mean, th- this is my thoughts, you know, the guys that are on the inside of the locker room, they matter the most right now. And that's, you know, that's, that's just the way it is. You know, if they feel good about their coaching staff going forward, then good. You know, we might have to make some changes still, but you know, then we can still feel good about Hawkeye football. We can still feel both good about where we are at as a team. Doesn't change the fact that, any way you look at it, we failed our black teammates during our time. 100%. Because, you know, whether they're allegations of systemic oppression or are true or not, doesn't matter because they felt it. They felt that they way. Feel, yeah. Because they, they, they didn't feel they had a voice enough to speak up about it. So we failed them there. And, you know, that breaks my heart. Don't feel good about it. Never will. I still, you know, I love that coaching staff and I have a great amount of respect for them. So I I hope, you know, we can get to a place where, you know, everyone in that locker room feels good about showing up to work every day without dropping our standards because at the end of the day, man, we, we go out there to win football games and we do that. We're not the most talented team. So we got to be the most disciplined team. We got to be the most ready team. So I, I hope we find, we, we, you know, we, I hope we find a solution. I don't envy the spot that KF's in. I, I feel, I feel really bad for him right now because he is just in a world of shit. Yep. And, you know, he's, I can only imagine how bad he feels because, you know, look, they don't, they don't, they don't bring you into Iowa football hoping you fail or expecting you to fail. Like, come on, that doesn't make sense, man. They want you to succeed in all areas of life. KF always talks about how he wants you to be a good student, citizen, and football player and be able to walk away from here four or five years and go. You know, if you have great, go to the NFL, great. If not, go be a great husband. Go be a great father. Go live a great life. And be proud of the way that, that you would live your life. So it hurts because I, I know that's what KF wants for his players. And the fact that his players didn't feel like they got that from him. I know that bothers that man. And it's a damn shame because <sighs> I don't know. I just feel like he doesn't deserve this. You know what? You know, extreme ownership. Yeah. You know, it happened under your watch. You're responsible at the same time. And it's a 20 year career that I don't know. It's a, it's an ugly blemish on his record. And you know, is it partially his fault? Yeah, absolutely. Is it as bad as people are alleging? I don't know. I don't know. I just hope that we can be better moving forward from this. And you know what? That's all I can say. Well said. Well said. Um, I agree with that. I, I don't. I don't need to say. I don't need to say anything. I agree with that. Um, like we said, this has been. This has been. Uh, the, I mean, Kevin just explained it. This has been tough, and. Our podcast 
and show has been about bringing the light to the positive things that happened at Iowa football. And that is going to be at least for the next couple of weeks, 100% po- impossible to do. Um, and so this episode is going to come out on Friday, the 12th. And, um, and the washed up walk-ons aren't going to have an episode till at least, uh, at least probably the 29th or maybe into July. Um, because it's, this needs to sit and this situation needs to continue to develop and, uh, and it, it wouldn't feel right to do the kind of show that we do. Um, I, I say that, I say that with one caveat, if we can get some guys on to have a conversation, that would be the only, um, that would be the only way we'll, we'll be releasing an episode in the next, uh, two or three weeks for sure. When you break a leg, you put a cast on it and let it heal. We're just going to let them cast that program up. Let them stay on the inside, heal it up. Um, we, we will be back eventually. Um, we, we appreciate um, you guys listening. This was a long one, two hours. Um, uh, and, and take this like you take everything else. Um, add it to everything that you're consuming and, and, um, and form your own opinion on it. Um, we, we've, we appreciate so much that you care what we have to say. It's not about us. It is about those who feel wronged. Um, and that's episode 123 of the Wash of Walk-Ons podcast. We will uh, we'll talk at you again at some point. Thanks.